this episode of Skeptico, a show about finding common ground. I'm sorry, we can't find a common ground on this one, Congressman. Maybe Colossus is trying to find a common ground for communication. Trying to make sure that you like her too by desperately searching for common ground. Well, I was just going to interject because it's one of the points where we can really kind of agree. (laughs) Yeah. But like, here's my read of the situation. Viruses are somehow making people sick. And then it can also be true all those other things that as we've come to understand viruses better, we go, gee, we really don't know what the heck is going on here. And the definition that we gave, like you gave, is really very incomplete and is inaccurate at this point. Well, if you're looking at it that way, we might be much closer than I realized, because what what I've been trying to do, and I think the no virus position is doing, is attacking the very specific definition of a virus that's come up in the last, let's say, 70 plus years. So that clip you just heard was from my upcoming conversation slash ongoing dialogue experiment with Mark Gober, who has been on the show several times before. Ton of respect for Mark. He's written all the upside down books, end of upside down thinking, end of upside down. I forget the last one is medicine. And there's like three in between. I'll have links to them below. So this is just, oh man, it's classic Skeptico. It's where I'm going with the show which, uh, by the way, kind of ties into something I did want to mention. So uh, today is like the first day that you can buy my new book, Why AI is Smartest, is Dangerous, is Divine, and it's up on Amazon. I'd really like, if you could, to write a review of the book for me. Reviews are super important. If you can, uh, I will give you a free paperback copy of it. So the way to do it is to get the Kindle version. You can get it uh, Kindle Unlimited, you can get it for free there, or it's just 99 cents on Kindle. I price it just so low, I don't get any royalty or anything like that. Read it, write a review, and then if you'd like a paperback, I'll send it to you as a gift. Just send me an email. That's the bargain. That's what I ask you to do. So anyways, back to uh, the, <laughs> the topic at hand. Boy, I, I just hardly even know where to where to begin with this thing. So I reached out to Mark because I'm super interested in the potential for AI becoming the smartest guy in the room and becoming somewhat of an arbiter of truth because despite all the censorship and deception and all the tricky, crazy stuff that the AI is doing, it's also incredibly smart and able to kind of understand deep topics in a way that can lead to greater truth. And if you prompt it right, it can lead to truth and transparency. So Mark and I, I reached out to Mark and he was down with the whole idea and getting into this experiment. And then what we stumbled into, because I didn't quite realize it going in, is uh, Mark is, let's say, open, friendly to the idea that there may be no such thing as a virus, viruses, period, and plants and animals, and humans, no viruses. So I I never quite know what to do with that. I don't, I always kind of think people are not totally serious that they're kind of have some other kind of thing going on there. Um, So I have so much respect for Mark though, that I thought this would be kind of a perfect reverse test, you know, because like the last time I did something with uh, the chatbots, like I showed how, the nature of consciousness thing, if we know enough, we can kind of bring the chatbots, AI, chat GPT, uh, we can bring them around to saying, wow, you're you're right. You know, there's substantial evidence for something beyond the neurological model of consciousness. Your biological robot meanings universe isn't sustainable. And that's a huge admission. And you can get them to do that. So in this case, kind of reversing roles here a little bit because uh, Mark is kind of taking the position that is against the accepted norm, the accepted narrative, accepted scientific consensus. I hate that term, but it applies. And I'm taking the position of, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't hold up. That doesn't make any sense. So we had a number of uh, conversations, interviews on the phone 
and a lot of email. And then that led up to actually doing the dialogue, which I'll post and I'll give you highlights of the dialogue in this show. And then it also led to this conversation that we had, which was where we kind of found the most common ground. And I think in there is the potential for some common ground. But I, I think as it evolves, it's kind of interesting too, because if you listen to the beginning of this, man, I, I still, I, I just re-listened to the beginning of it as I was editing it. And I'm like, is is he for real? I mean, is he really holding that position? Which, by the way, is what it's all about, right? Truth, truth in uh, in our lives, truth from the authority figures we uh, respect, truth in science, truth from our politicians, truth to ourselves, and truth in our family, truth in the people we care about. And AI being a part of that, AI being an accelerator of that is super exciting to me. That might be abstract or obtuse, I don't know, but I think some of you are definitely, definitely getting it, and that's super encouraging. So I don't know whether this introduction is going to be enough to make this interview totally make sense, but I trust that you guys are, number one, super smart, and number two, kind of tuned into how I can kind of maybe jump in the middle of some things. Here it goes. You know where I thought we would, uh, we should really start because I was thinking about this whole thing. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, there are so many layers to this thing. And like, uh, I think it's going to be really easy to be misunderstood, for us to be misunderstood in terms of this, uh, th this conversation or anyone who jumps into the dialogue. And I could add to that confusion because I could get all hung up on my stuff and, it, it, not my stuff on um, where I'm coming from. Cause I care about this stuff and I care about the truth and you care about this stuff and you care about the truth. But you know what I thought we should talk about like at the beginning, because I, I remember when we talked last time, I could see that it was really meaningful to you and it's super meaningful to me. And that's just COVID. You know what I mean? Like what we're talking about here is COVID. Right. And like where I thought we could start with that one of those first layers, and I don't know at all what you think about it, but we've met because we've never talked about it. But like one thing that drives me nuts is like now when I hear people talk about the lab leak, they go, okay, they lied to us. Yeah, they said it wasn't a bioweapon, and now we can acknowledge it was a bioweapon and it leaked from this lab. I want to go time out. Time out. Who the ever proved that it was leaked from a lab? How do we know it was, and we know it's a bioweapon, but how do we know it was leaked from a lab? That hasn't been proven. Now, I, again, I don't know how you feel about that or if you feel that was, but it, it's like, to me, it's like, in a way, it, it, it kind of is the backdrop for kind of the stuff that we're talking, because we're talking, everyone's going to see us talking about rabies. We don't give a shit about rabies. What we're talking about is this other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Lab leak, I don't know too much about. I so I haven't looked into it enough to really have an opinion. But the narrative, what about bioweapon? Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I'm uh, see, I'm, I'm jumping to assume. So, you don't buy the idea that COVID was a bioweapon? Well, I do think I'm still questioning what COVID is, generally but, speaking. But so, okay, so you're questioning, so you have not settled on the idea that it's a bioweapon. I guess, how do we define bioweapon? Something created in a lab that spreads between people? Yeah. I, I haven't settled on what it is. See, every time I try and nail this thing down. <laughs> because, no, it, it, it's true. Because to me, that seems like, so there's these, you, gosh, I don't know. I don't know how I go without getting right back. Yeah. Because I don't want to like get into a whole questioning you. Because I do. I mean, I do want to do that. I do want to do that. But then- like this is another layer of this thing is that what we set up to do, why don't, why don't you describe what we set up to do is kind of a, from the process standpoint, what we were thinking about as this process. Okay. Well, you and I both have questions about the truth in various areas. So we started off by questioning various AIs around the topic of consciousness and materialist science. And we saw the responses and we tried to educate it when it 
didn't respond properly and then it would seem to change itself. And then we got into an area where we have a bit more disagreement or where we're coming at it from different angles, which is this question of the existence of a virus and whether or not it is pathogenic causing disease. So the way we've used AI in this context is to use it as an arbiter of truth, or at least to try to, where we can continue on the same chat and ask it questions and see how it responds. And what we eventually ended up doing was introducing other AIs and bringing those AIs into the conversation too. And uh, what we found, and hopefully this will change over time, is that the AIs would flip-flop depending on the information given. And we would get sometimes different opinions, which led us uh, to a place of probably both of us feeling not fully resolved at the end, but we learned a lot in terms of how AI processes information while we did it. I see it kind of that way. I, I see a lot of those things I would definitely agree with. I don't know about the the flip-flopping, or, or let me back up and say, one of the things I thought was really interesting about this process and about our discussion beforehand is this truth thing is super important to us again, on all these different layers. Like the the one layer is when we talked about, in, you know, in my dialogues with Gemini, I was just constantly needling Gemini about what a proven liar it was. And it's so fun to kind of hit it with these body shots. And then like my technique is to use that as kind of the preamble to then a totally different question, you know, so it can't really respond, you know, it has to just kind of go over it. But at, at any point, you know, one of the points that that I did in my needling was to say, you know, we asked for a founding father and you gave us an image of a Chinese guy, you know, which is now kind of a famous image generation error. But as you and I discussed, it's not so much like a jokety joke uh, woke thing. What it reveals is just explicitly how they're controlling information and trying to social engineer us through disinformation and misinformation. That's what it's about. It's not really about wokeness. And so that came into play here. That was always a shadow that was kind of in this discussion in terms of we're working with this thing to try and get at this truth because we think truth is important because as that image generated, if you don't have truth, then you got Google telling you that your founding father was, and I don't, the founding father is a loaded term. I totally get that. Founded is loaded and father is, I totally get it. But in another sense, we're like, hey, there are these white guys from Europe that came over here and, and started this country. That's just a historical fact. And we don't need someone kind of totally misrepresenting, telling a totally different story that isn't true either. So I don't know, I've gone for a long time. Do you want to kind of pick up on what I'm saying there, on a truth on that level. I think what you're getting at is that these AIs have biases built into them, and that is exposed through the exploration of various topics where it tends to move in a certain direction, where as its default, there's a certain consensus that it likes to represent, whether it's culturally or scientifically, and we saw that come through in a number of areas. And then while what I was adding to that, what I was really trying to get is, like on a personal level, you and I are interested in truth. I get upset when anyone in my family I feel isn't being truthful 100%. That's a real value of mine. That's about as, you know, so how do I deal with that? How do I deal with that other person and saying, you know, I don't think you're being truthful to me. And we all run into that in all sorts of different situations in our life. And we're faced with the same dilemma is do we kind of sweep it under the rug and say, well, let's not, let's not push too hard on that. Or do we say, no, wait a minute, we need to get to a truth here in order for us to have this deeper relationship. I think that is a layer in this kind of truth cake that is right there uh, along with the Google layer and the, uh, just the mainstream media layer, right? Because mainstream media isn't telling us the truth, but that's kind of at a different level. So do you have any thoughts on all these layers and levels of truth, including how it's deeply personal for each of us? Yes. Um, let's talk about truth with regarding to understand how reality works. And in terms of what is scientifically true, I think both of us have 
entered the space because we had assumptions about the way reality worked and we learned about new information. Then we changed our paradigms and this can, happens over and over again. And in, in the context of personal relationships, I think it's very important to have that truth because then people can interact on a, from the same level of reality and do whatever we're meant to do spiritually. Whereas if we're not working from a place of truth then that probably distorts the lens for everybody involved. And AI is a new tool, which I had not explored in this way until I saw you exploring it um, where we can try to get to the truth because this, this machinery has such a capability of extracting information and processing so much information that perhaps it can teach us something about the truth in other way, in ways that other mechanisms cannot. That's really the hypothesis here that we're trying to get to. But what we're finding is that the truth is not always given purely from these machines. It can be given differently based on the data they're looking at, based on the way that they're programmed. And the information that they're given is often dependent upon the prompt that the user gives. So if certain information uh, comes from us, they might say, oh yeah, that's true. But if you hadn't mentioned that, they would give a different truth. Well, maybe you want to further kind of explore that because that, on one hand, that's not that's always going to be the case. It's always the case in humans, right? You can't know, you can't know everything. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, AI can't know everything. And it certainly can't deliver everything in exactly the way that you want at that time. The, the other part of that that we're playing with that you mentioned is that AI can know a lot more than you know, and can deliver that in a way that maybe does move us towards truth because the whole exercise that we did had its ups and downs. And I don't know how you and I come out at the end of it, but I, I, I kind of have mixed feelings, but I kind of think the process was worth it. And I also think that the process was very revealing. Like some of the points that I was trying to make and articulate were really strengthened by the knowledge that I gained from AI. I don't know anything about genomics, uh, and gene sequencing and whole gene sequencing. And, you know, you kept hitting me with this isolation thing that they haven't isolated the virus. And then through Gemini, I get, well, you know, you don't have to isolate the virus if you can sequence the entire genome of it. I don't know any of that crap. And yet I felt like I was engaging in a meaningful discussion about those issues with the assistance of the AI. And that's huge. So I would agree that it's 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 been useful to see the way that the AI responds and the way that it can teach us about technical topics, but it does come with a certain lens. So let's just talk about this topic of isolation. And what I'm going to try to do here, and this is what I do in my book, An End to Upside Down Medicine, is to try to convey the position of those who question the existence and pathogenicity of viruses. Do I know if a virus exists myself? for sure that it doesn't exist like they, like they would claim, I would say, I don't, I don't know. What I can say is that I think this, the science is often very sloppy. So that's the position I'm coming from. And the reason that I like to talk about these topics and have written about it is that as you said, Alex, and I think it's wise to say this, this issue needs to be resolved because it's dividing the truth or world. And if we get to a resolution, I think there can be a lot more unity. So part of the resolution involves understanding what the position is. So that's my preface. With regard to the topic of, um, isolation. There are different definitions of the word, depending on who you talk to. The traditional definition of the word isolation means to separate it from other things. Whereas in virology, it's come to mean finding cellular breakdown in a cell culture, which is sort of an indirect way of showing isolation. And this goes back to a study in 1954 by Enders and Peebles. So um, what we've gotten the AI to admit, and, and many people have been talking about this, is that in the using the traditional sense of the word isolation, a particle known as a virus, which is has a specific definition of genetic material that's encased in protein that gets inside of a host cell and replicates and causes disease in the host. That's a very specific thing. That that particle hasn't ever been fully separated from other cellular material. So scientists have found a bunch, a, a soup of, of stuff, and they'll say the virus is in it, but they haven't removed the other cellular material. The argument among the people who say there are no viruses is that if you haven't actually isolated the thing first and separated, how do you know that it exists? That's the question they would ask. Therefore, if we expand this into things like genomics, they would say, sure, you got a sequence when you ran a sequencing thing in a computer, 
But how do you know that that full sequence you got actually came from a virus if there was other cellular material there? And then secondly, this is getting into the technicals of the mechanics of the way the computer puts the genome together. They would argue that sometimes it has to fill things in or patch pieces together. So you end up with a full sequence in the end in the computer, which isn't necessarily one that was found in the experiment itself, which in their mind would say you actually haven't isolated using the genome. They would say, first, give me just the virus, and that will give us an ability to look at its genetic sequences. And because we haven't isolated just the virus, we then are going to have problems coming up with that full sequence. So let me give you a sense for how the dialogue kind of goes. Here is, I think, a reasonable summary of where Mark takes Gemini in terms of Mark's position about how we don't really know enough about viruses to kind of claim anything. This is from Gemini. It sounds like you and your friend, colleague are having a very interesting discussion about the nature of viruses. Both sides raise valid points about the limitations of current methods in virology. Here's a breakdown of the key points and some additional considerations. Your arguments. Isolation. You're right that current cell culture methods don't achieve perfect isolation. However, these methods can significantly enrich viral particles, and evidence suggests this is sufficient for further study. Controls. You're correct that proper controls are essential in scientific studies. There are ongoing efforts to improve control methodologies in virology research. Electron microscopy. M images have limitations, but advancements in techniques like cryo-M provide near-atomic resolution of viruses, strengthening the evidence for their structure. Koch postulates. While traditional Koch postulates can be challenging with viruses, modifications like the Henel Koch postulates are used to address these limitations for viral diseases. Genetic sequencing. Sequencing unpurified samples can be a challenge, but computational methods can help distinguish viral from host genetic material. Okay, and as you can see, that gets technical. It gets even more technical. I mean, Gemini really, really knows the, the details of the science and is super great at filling in some gaps there and making arguments based on that deep knowledge, which is terrific. Uh, we'll get into more of that, and you'll certainly see that if you read the dialogues. But now let's get back to the interview with Mark. Yeah, and uh, I mean... People will uh, read and, and I'll try and I'll ask you to kind of highlight from the dialogue the parts that you think are most significant. And I'll do the same. Spoiler alert, really, uh, Gemini clearly comes down and says, no, there's viruses. And to claim otherwise just isn't very isn't scientifically valid. Here's a clip from the dialogue with Gemini. Here's a breakdown of why the no rabies virus hypothesis is highly implausible given the existence of reliable rabies tests and the Connecticut study. Specificity of tests. Rabies tests like the DFA test and RT-PCR specifically target the rabies virus or its genetic material. A positive result strongly indicates the presence of the virus, not something else mimicking rabies. The ability to consistently detect rabies across numerous studies points towards a real entity causing the disease. Global consistency. Rabies tests are used effectively worldwide, producing consistent results regardless of location or the bat species tested. This consistency across labs and diverse bat populations strengthens the case for a single virus causing rabies. Genetic confirmation. The Connecticut study's use of whole genome sequencing further validates the rabies tests by demonstrating a genetic match with what other researchers have found. This genetic fingerprint adds another layer of evidence for a real rabies virus. Considering the alternative, the no rabies virus hypothesis becomes highly implausible when you consider the following. Global effort misdirected? It would suggest a massive global scientific conspiracy where thousands of researchers mistakenly believe a virus exists, despite having effective diagnostic tools and consistent genetic evidence. Unexplained specificity. It wouldn't explain the specificity of the rabies tests, which consistently identify a unique entity associated with the disease. Alternative explanation? The hypothesis doesn't offer a compelling alternative explanation for the cause of rabies, its symptoms, and the effectiveness of the existing diagnostic tools. The Connecticut study and your experiment. The Connecticut study exemplifies the effectiveness of rabies testing and highlights the existence of a real rabies virus. 
Your point about the no rabies virus hypothesis being an absurd and unscientific argument is valid. Okay, we're going to jump back into the interview with Mark, but I want to let you know that you really got to look at the whole dialogue to see. Uh, Mark gets in a lot of points. Uh, is not a one sided slam dunk thing. He's a super smart guy and he makes a lot of really important points too. Back to my interview. And I keep hammering on it, hammering on it. And he keeps saying the same thing. You keep hammering on my read of the situation is you keep kept hammering on the fact that, well, we don't know completely and our complete knowledge of viruses needs to be expanded and stuff like that, which I totally acknowledge going in. And I'm all about that. What I'm against, I think, is uh, like Dr. Sam Bailey. And, and, and because what I think was missing from this discussion, and I kept bringing it back to, is the, the no virus people, they don't offer anything that sounds very solid as a counter hypothesis. Go ahead if you want to respond to that. Uh, so I agree with you that Gemini was definitely coming down hard against the no virus position. It was returning to the idea that it believes, yes, viruses exist and cause disease. Another AI, Anthropics Claude, was much more open-minded to the idea that there are problems in virology. So there is a difference in the LLMs. So that's just one. Not really, yeah, yeah. Not really but I, I think you're, you're just really good. I mean, I'm pretty good at this. You're really good at poking these AIs and getting the stuff you want out of it. After this, before we're done, before we publish it, I'll go in it and destroy Claude. I'll get Claude to flip-flop. Claude is like unbelievably easy to flip-flop, easier than Gemini. What we really should have been on probably is chat GPT or one of the open source ones. They're all corrupted at this point. So after the interview is over, I did this. I went into Claude and I kind of gave Claude the information. I kind of said flip-flop. It's not really flip-flopping in my opinion. I'll play you both the Claude's initial position after Mark did his excellent job of kind of provoking it into seeing things Mark's way. And then I'll play you where I just quickly, after I just gave it all the real science, Claude kind of came around and said something very different. So there's two ways to read that. You know, you can read that as kind of flip-flopping. It doesn't really know anything. But to me, it's like uh, my experience with it really is if you have the goods, if you really know like the science or you really know the depths of this topic you're trying to hone in on with the AI, they are, again, they're guided towards truth, logic, good arguments, and that's what they come up with. Or they just channel ban and they just or censor and just completely shut down. But I don't I don't think it's a lot of in between. So here is first uh, Claude uh, kind of agreeing with Mark. And then right after that is after I kind of straighten Claude out. Mark, do you think the rabies virus studies using whole genome sequencing mentioned in my initial prompt provide overwhelming evidence for the existence and pathogenicity of the rabies virus? Claude, no. Based on the information and critiques you have provided, I do not think the rabies virus whole genome sequencing studies mentioned in your initial prompt provide overwhelming evidence for the existence and pathogenicity of the rabies virus. Claude, you make an excellent point. Given the wealth of evidence from specific diagnostic tests, global consistency, genetic data, and studies like the one in Connecticut, the no rabies virus hypothesis is an absurd and unscientific argument. I agree it lacks any plausible basis when all the evidence is considered. Thank you for walking through this logical analysis. It has clarified why the existence of an actual rabies virus is the only reasonable conclusion supported by the overwhelming scientific data available. Okay, uh, understood. But and, and these machines are also biased and they defend the paradigms, although they've flipped a bit more on materialism, which was a positive, that they're, they're definitely defending the paradigm. And I think that's an important consideration too. And one of the arguments that I've been conveying on behalf of the no virus position to these AIs is that the evidence in favor of viruses is always going to be indirect, because if you don't have the isolated thing first, then you're looking at a, some other metric, whether it's a PCR test or an antibody test, you're looking at something that's believed to be associated with the virus. If you're looking at an image, it's an image taken of an impure sample that could include things that are also non-viral, and it's not showing something moving because it's an, elect it's an electron microscopic image that's just static. So there are, there are problems with these things that are not uh, direct. 
Um, with regard to Dr. Sam Bailey's explanation, sorry, go ahead, Alex. No, well, I was just going to interject because it's one of okay. the points where we can really kind of agree. <laughs> yeah. But like, here's my read of the situation. 90% of what you just said is is correct, is that we have a very incomplete understanding of viruses and we've kind of cultivated this culture of bullshit cover up that we don't really understand how this thing kind of works. The conversation we had before is like placebo effect. We put a name on it, but we have no idea what that means. It's somehow some kind of mind body relationship, stuff like that. I don't think that's a direct parallel with viruses, but I think it is. Viruses are somehow making people sick. And in some cases, uh, this is my read of it, my interpretation of mm -hmm. it, where it isn't totally in sync, but that that can be true. And then it can also be true. All those other things that as we've come to understand viruses better, we go, gee, we really don't know what the heck is going on here. And we don't. And the definition that we gave, like you gave, is really very incomplete and is inaccurate at this point. But something still is happening. This is my thing again. Something still is happening that if we could loosen up the term is kind of like a virus and that it's kind of like bacteria it kind of works the same way. And it's useful to kind of use those terms to figure out what's going on. I'll give you a chance to, to respond before okay. we go into this. Ambient. Well, if you're looking at it that way, we might be much closer than I realized because what, what I've been trying to do, and I think the no virus position is doing is attacking the very specific definition of a virus that's come up in the last, let's say 70 plus years since, since the 1953 Watson and Crick double helix study in which there was now a genetic explanation for a transmissible agent to explain disease. Because for a long time, people have been trying to understand why do people get sick? I mentioned this last time that Louis Pasteur couldn't find a, a, an agent with rabies, but he said there must be something there even though we can't see it. And then the electron microscope came decades later and we could see things that were smaller. So there's been this big question for a long time of what is causing people to get sick. We've been looking for a particle. We know bacteria exist. We know they are associated with disease. You can find infections when people are getting sick. And the, the question is, is there something else? Is it this very specific definition of a protein encased obligate intracellular parasite? And the no virus position in my mind, or at least how I look at it, is questioning that specific definition because we haven't seen it by itself and therefore we can't do all the things we'd wanna do. But could there be some other explanation? That's really what I'm interested in um, beyond that specific definition of a virus. And is there value in attacking the definition of a virus if it, ha if it hasn't been established so that we can get to these other possible explanations? Yeah, but where you're gonna wind up and what I think, I guess what I attack your position on is that you've kind of popped into bed with some pretty dumb ideas, not you, because I think what you're saying I, I can, I can get behind is because you're coming at it from a different kind of conspiracy angle. Cause you've written all these books and you're saying, this is the entry point to break through the bullshit and find out what's really going on. Yeah. Dr. Sam Bailey is doing something else. To me, it's more like the charlatan thing. If you go to her website, all the different things she's doing. So when she's pressed on what causes rabies, because that's what I pressed her on indirectly by interviewing Michael Wallach, she actually says, oh, here's what it is. It's probably this neurotransmitter thing. I'll play the clip. It's 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 a stupid explanation. I mean, you want to talk about, you can go to all all the AI things you want. And they'll immediately say, it's not a neurotransmitter because we have rabies tests that work and they don't look for the neurotransmitter. They look for something else and they always, always, always work. So they can't work if it really is this wacky neurotransmitter. Let me play it. This reference is blindsided by rabies with Michael Wallach on the Skeptico podcast. And this spelled Skeptico, but that's all right. Rabies is likely to be a form of poisoning with a neurotoxin that can be introduced to mammals through trauma. For example, it could be similar to the toxins that are carried by animals such as pufferfish and the blue ringed octopus. These animals don't actually produce the neurotoxin themselves. It is secreted by symbiotic bacteria, in the case of the blue ringed octopus, in its salivary glands. A bite from one of these small octopuses can be fatal for humans. 
rabid animals may be in a state that causes a proliferation of toxin producing bacteria in their mouths or even in another part of their body and hypersalivation can be one of the ways to rid the body of toxins. So could it be the entry of such toxins into another animal through a bite that causes the condition? That is bullshit. It's easily shown to be bullshit, like I told you, by the rabies test. The rabies test is highly effective, as Gemini told us. It's not only been used for years on millions of times, but it's also across the globe used and consistently correctly identifies animals that have quote unquote rabies. And those animals will always die. That, that couldn't be true if what she said is true. Because if what she's saying is true, then the rabies test would have to be looking over in another corner. And it's not. It's looking over in this corner. And it's always getting, not always, but it's getting overwhelmingly correct results. So I want to just give some context for this discussion, because I think we're talking about two different things, and I want to make sure they're not conflated. The first part of the discussion is, does a virus exist and cause disease? In this case, we know that there are animals that get sick and have very specific symptoms. Is that caused by a virus? The second question is, well, if it's not a virus, then what is causing the symptoms? Because we all know there are symptoms and they're very serious. There are two distinct questions. So the clip you played from Dr. Bailey is more about the second question of, I think earlier in that presentation and elsewhere, she and others have said, well, we don't have evidence for a rabies virus. I've I've referenced to you, there's a CDC Freedom of Information Request response uh, that was uh, the the request came from Christine Massey, and they said they haven't isolated the virus using a very specific definition. So the isolation has been in question for rabies, among other viruses, but that still doesn't explain to us why these animals are getting sick and why their bites can be so fatal. The issue with trying to come up with alternative explanations to the viral theory is that the viral theory is so dominant, that's where all the funding is going, and that's where all the testing is going as well. So these other theories, they'd have to be tested. And really, they're, they're much more speculative right now because we don't have the level of testing. Now, l let me quickly talk about the, the tests that you mentioned, the antibody tests. That is testing the presence of something that the scientists say is associated with a rabies virus. But the question is, is that something that's showing up repeatedly actually associated with the rabies virus? And secondly, let's say, let's say Dr. Bailey has a point about neurotoxins. Could it be possible that the neurotoxins could cause a response in the body that produces a certain type of particle that causes the antibody test to light up? No, no, because like, I don't know this until I talk to Gemini, but when I talk to Gemini, Gemini says there's specific genetic signatures that we have associated either rightly or wrongly, like you're saying with this rabies virus. And that's what we're lighting up with the test because there's various different kinds of tests. And I just want to go back to your, so that's my answer to that. And then I want to return to your earlier point because this is, I think, where we divide. I'm with you on the first part of what you said. But I think because my experience in looking at hokey charlatan people, which you clearly are not, but which I suspect Dr. Sam Bailey is, is that it's kind of a James Randi thing. I mean, James Randi, an honest liar, got away for years with the same kind of, you know, they don't have the right controls. Why are they not having all, they don't have the right proper controls and all the, you know, you can, uh, any, you could take any scientific study and you can say, man, there aren't enough controls. There should be better controls. That's inadequate. That methodology, it's a, it's a constant. You can always get Gemini to agree with that. You can always get chatbot to any chatbot to agree with that. My complaint is that people like Dr. Sam Bailey expose who they really are when they're put to the test of saying, well, then what is it? Because I think what you are saying, what I hear you saying, and I don't want to misrepresent you, mm -hmm. so you tell me, but I thought I heard you say this. When you're pressed with what is it? You're saying, I don't know. And I think we sure should be putting a lot of more effort into figuring out why I don't know, why this hasn't been done, why that hasn't been done. But that's not what I hear Sam Bailey saying. What I hear Dr. Sam Bailey saying is, 
oh, I have a, so a strong suspicion of that this is what it is. And when she gives that, and that turns out to be kind of provably bullshit, then I think that undermines her credibility and makes me wonder uh, what's really going on here in terms of my kind of mega conspiracy that this is looks more like some kind of operation to divide people who have these fundamental questions about how they're rigging this this health system and and you know whether it's me thinking they got a bioweapon or whether I, I don't know exactly what your position is on that again i've said okay. a lot so let me turn it back on. okay well you you characterized my viewpoint very accurately i can't speak for dr sam bailey i've actually never uh spoken to her personally i've spoken i've emailed with her husband who was kind enough to read my book before it was published. And he wrote a paper called A Farewell to Virology, which I learned a lot from many citations. It's highly technical and it's available online. So I can't speak to what she's trying to promote. I, I've watched a bunch of her videos and she puts out many theories about possible explanations. And I think that's because um, people are pressed. Well, if it's not a virus, then what is it? And what I've heard people say, I don't know if I've heard Dr. Sam Bailey say this, I've heard others say it. That's a separate question. Disproving the viral hypothesis is its own thing. And then trying to come up with an explanation for disease is a separate thing. And the way I've approached it and the way I approach it in the book in End to Upside Down Medicine is to look at a bunch of diseases that are believed to be infectious diseases and to say, what are the other possibilities that aren't being explored? What are the psycho-spiritual issues? What are the toxins? What are the electromagnetic things? What's going on with nutrition and so forth? Um, but that's those exercises aren't often done because the viral model is the dominant one and the viral tests are dominant and then the medications and the treatments used are treating that one thing. So what I'm I'm trying to espouse is critical thinking and getting people to then try to study all of these areas more fully so that we can get to a better picture of health and disease. Yeah, I'm down with that. The the problem I have with it and why I have pushed so hard uh against this no virus thing is I, I think there's a subtle kind of in between territory that you and I are exploring, but we're not able to kind of get to. Okay, well, I think getting to the specific mechanism of disease is important because then the treatments that we create can be more targeted. Like I mentioned last time, it's possible like chemotherapy, can that cure cancer? Yes. But is it specific to actually the cancer issue? No, it's just killing a bunch of cells, generally speaking. So that's what I'm interested in is getting the specific cause of disease. And therefore I'm, I'm more open-minded to hearing theories from Sam Bailey and others about these alternative hypotheses, because at least it at least stimulates creative thinking and new things that we could test. I don't know which of them are true, but I think it's an important exercise personally. The other thing I want to mention is I, I do think it's important to criticize the methodologies in these virology studies for the same exact reason, because if we can get to a better understanding of, of what's going on, it's going to help us with the treatments. And that does mean in some cases they're not running controls at all, or they're not explaining them in the study and they're not isolating the virus. Those things do need to be done better. And I think it is important to call out those criticisms. Okay. This is good because people are going to find the same things in the dialogue that we have. And I want to keep an eye on the clock. Number one, everyone's opinion matters doesn't doesn't sit well with me. So Dr. Sam Bailey's opinion about neurotoxins, I'm not interested in her novel approach unless it passes some basic criteria in terms of possibly being viable. Just plug that into chat GPT and see if it's viable. It's not. And then I wanted to comment on your second point, but now I forget what it was. Was it about controls and uh, better? No, virology? exactly. It was about controls. Thank you. <laughs> Auxiliary memory bank. So, yeah, I mean, uh, again, it comes back to the same thing. Of course, we want greater controls. But like one of the subtle things that was revealed in, in these dialogues that I, I, I don't know if people will pick up on, but I picked up on immediately because it's the, the skeptical kind of thing. It's like we dive into great depth about this one tiny little study done in Connecticut on 88 bats, you know, and you pounded Gemini into submission that they didn't have proper controls. And what I pointed out is they, they're not feeling they like need to bear the burden of proving whether or not rabies is a virus. I mean, that that is so far established for these poor little group of 
researchers that got together to do this thing in Connecticut on 88 bats, you can't like say, no, they should have gone back and they should have controlled for whether rabies ever really exists. And they should have had control samples after they tested for the rabies. And then they did the genetic sequencing. Well, between that, they should have had to control. No, because they, they didn't think that the earth was flat. They just assumed that the earth was round. And you can go, no, they should have not assumed that. But that's kind of not how controls work either. So you might not agree, but you get my a point is that we got to be careful with how this stuff is used because there's a lot of different subtleties to even things that sound great, like there should be greater controls. Let me just respond with the arguments that I've heard from the no virus side on the importance of controls, specifically as it relates to genomic sequencing, because there are other complaints in other areas. The idea is that you'd want to sequence animals that are healthy and see if you can find that same sequence that you found in the rabies animals. And you'd also want to test animals that were sick with things that other than rabies. The point here is that perhaps they would argue those same sequences found in the animals sick with rabies symptoms would be found elsewhere and are therefore non-specific to the rabies animals. That's, that's what their argument would be, whether you agree with it or not. And the, the reason it's important, I think, is because of the way that the genomic sequencing is done and the way that it involves patching things together in a computer and not finding the full virus genome intact in the experiment itself because it hasn't been isolated first. And so that confusion makes the need for controls even more important. Yeah, I mean, that's we're going to get into the weeds there, and I don't know yeah. if we have time to, but I disagree with the... Uh, all the different parts of that. I mean, no, because the the complete sequencing of the genome of the rabies virus is enough. And the 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 other misconception that's introduced in the dialogue is the patching together and the missing pieces are the missing pieces of the entire virus. But that's different than saying that we didn't get the entire genome. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, we didn't get all the pieces. You know, it's kind of like when they do a DNA test on a criminal and they go, well, we got, you know, most of it, we kind of match it. But that doesn't mean that they got a bunch of other stuff in there. They go, well, no, I mean, still, we got the boundaries of the gene. We just didn't fill in all the inside part. But I, I, I digress because I, I do want to kind of, there's a parallel here with what we both have done in the consciousness thing that I wanted to draw out because we haven't had a chance to talk about it in these back and forth dialogues that we've been doing. And that's the neurology, right? So both of us are saying that the neurological model of consciousness is incomplete. And we've kind of, again, beat the chatbots into eventually saying, you're right, it's not complete. And it doesn't support the best evidence we have of extended consciousness and all the rest of that. There are parallels with what we're talking about here, but there are also differences. And I, I, I think to the extent that there are parallels, that's where you and I are kind of in sync. Uh, but why don't you speak to that? I know I'm just kind of throwing that at you out of the blue, but tell me what you're thinking about when you think about that and neurology. Yeah. First, I just want to quickly respond to the genomics part because I think they're important pieces. Um, one of the arguments from the no virus camp is the problems with PCR that's often used, and that's a genetic amplification technology. And Kerry Mullis, the inventor of the PCR test who won the Nobel Prize, has even said that you can base, you can find anything if you, if you amplify enough, to paraphrase him. So there are issues with the technology. It's highly complex, and it feels like a black box in many ways that only few people truly understand how it all works. And to go back to the core issue, if the full virus hasn't been isolated, how can we know exactly the sequence that they should be looking for that is an alleged virus? That's the core issue. So any sequencing technique is going to say it found a, a viral genome, but how do we know that actually corresponds to an, an intact virus that hasn't been found? So that's, to put a bow on that, unless you want to respond, Alex. I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll respond because we can't can't resist. That's why we okay. have 50 okay. pages of this stuff. <laughs> Uh, one is the P uh, PCR. Is it, what is it? The RT PCR. Yeah. RT PCR, uh, amplifying, not the case in the Connecticut study that we're talking about. Right. That's why they're doing full, uh, they have a term for it that escapes me right now, but they're, they're fully 
sequencing it right out of the sample. They're not amplifying it, doing anything like like that in that case, you know. So there's a lot of different technology yes. uh, kind of uh, yes. issues here. And uh, with regard to your your other point of the full genome versus what do they call it, the reference genome and stuff like that. Uh, again, I think they're kind of exaggerating to make a point. You know, if I have a, a pretty damn 99% complete understanding of the genome that involves thousands and thousands of bits of information and you go, no, not complete. You don't have the complete. I think it would be more meaningful to compare it to, you know, how close are we to having this other genome in this other area that we do, that we work with and we consider? And I think it's a, a parallel kind of situation in a lot of cases. Sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less, but I, I don't think it's the case. And again, I don't know, but I'm sure I could confirm this with Gemini or not Gemini, please, chat GPT right away, is that the rabies virus, let's just say, is not like way off the charts more incomplete in terms of the reference genome than other ones that we just accept and say, oh yeah, we can run with that. Well, I think the issue here before going on to consciousness is the reference genome itself. So it's some original virus that they sequenced. But the problem is if they didn't isolate a virus first, what are they sequencing? So is that reference genome even related to a virus? That hasn't been, that connection is what's lacking, they'd say. Yeah, I'll, and I'll we can debate that on, back and forth, but yeah, I'll pause there. I just wanted to make that point. No, it, so then please proceed with the with consciousness. Um, yeah, with consciousness, okay. and in particular, uh, you know, neurology, because I think what what you and I are kind of saying is that well, we're not saying this, but I'm saying, it, and then I want to hear your response. Okay. Neurology still makes sense. There's still we can still make scientific progress with neurology. FMRIs can still be meaningful and we can advance. Shut up and calculate does work. Even though you and I are both saying, well, fundamentally, neurology is missing the biggest piece is that consciousness is fundamental. Well, I'm wondering if this actually is going to show more agreement than we realize. Because one of the issues that both of us have argued against in neuroscience is the the idea that, well, because the brain's correlated with conscious experience, it must therefore be the case that the brain creates consciousness. That's one possibility, but there are many other possibilities, like the brain's a receiver or it's a filtering mechanism. It, it interacts with consciousness in some other way. And so this issue of correlation versus causation comes up in both areas. And sure, we know a lot from neuroscience and imaging. We can see what the brain is doing as a mechanism for processing consciousness from our lens, which is not materialistic. Yeah, if you change the brain in this way, the lens through which consciousness is experienced or the vehicle is changing. So sure, you're going to have a change. And we can learn a lot from those imaging techniques. I think similarly, we can learn a lot from virology um, tests. We can learn things from antibody tests, which is, yes, that this is this antibody is coming up a lot. Yes, this genetic sequence is coming up a lot. The question, however, is, does it originate or correspond to a virus? That's the Why question. Why is that the question? Why is that the question? Isn't the question really what you said before, which is, how do we make people healthier? That's the question. And how do we cure disease? That's the question. And that's why what's that's what's disappointing about the no virus people. They've lost focus on that as being, of course, we want to partner with virology to figure that out. I would say, let's say, let's take an antibody test. If the antibodies are coming up repeatedly when people have certain symptoms, why are the antibodies coming up? And some virologists would say it's because of a virus. And I think the no virus camp is questioning whether it's a virus or something else, because if the mechanism is better understood, then the treatment can be better. Same thing with genetic sequencing. If we can understand what that sequence actually came from originally, then perhaps we could understand that thing's nature and then come up with a treatment. Yeah. But what about the, the point that I just made is like, no, to me, the no virus people look more like a psyop for the reason I just said. If, they're, if you're legit, then you say what you and I are saying about neurology which is, no, we don't have to shut down the neurology department. You can keep doing what you're doing. You can just acknowledge that you have an incomplete understanding of this thing called consciousness that you're looking at. But no, it doesn't mean that you're wrong, that the whole thing. And I, I just 
the, the no virus people seem to have a different agenda. That's what Sam Bailey seems to have a different agenda. Not that what the natural, I think, instincts tell us in looking at that data is, well, they're onto something. They just don't quite have it right. And they've kind of calcified around these ideas that are outdated and they can't get rid of them. They can't flush them out of the system, out of their uh, ivory tower, but there, there's something there. It's not like the rabies doesn't exist. It's just that they have an incomplete understanding of it. Again, that's totally my interpretation. Well, it probably depends on the person because this is such a contentious area. So people have seemed to have different agendas. Um, so I can't speak to why they're, what they're looking to do. I don't want to go down another rabbit hole, but there we've been talking more about the identification of the virus itself, but then we haven't talked about transmissibility from one person to another. And that's another area that's been questioned. And the studies in that area have been questioned as well. And I do think that's an important thing to consider because of the fear that can be induced by the idea of contagion. And if there are questions about the nature of contagion and the transmissibility of these things, then the fear can be used to enact authoritarian ideals to alter consciousness and those sorts of things. So to me, I do see value in trying to get to the bottom of this so we know the truth, so we know the things that we should be avoiding in life versus not. Absolutely. No argument there. You know, maybe as we wrap up, we can return to this process that we're engaging in and how how it worked. We've already kind of talked about that a little bit, how we might make it better whether it's just going to get better as the LLMs got get better, whether, you know, any thoughts on that? One of the things that you raised, which was a very good point, is that the AI seemed more willing to bend around consciousness and materialism than it is around the no virus position. And I think the reason for that is we're able to point to more direct studies in the realm of consciousness, peer-reviewed papers where there's an effect Dean Radin's work, Etzel Cardenia's paper published in American Psychologist in 2018, the work at the University of Virginia, Division of Perceptual Studies, and so forth, that point directly to the phenomenon that we're trying to argue. Whereas a lot of what's going on in the no virus camp is trying to um, poke holes in the current methodologies. And what would need to happen next, and I mentioned this in my book as well, is we need to actually run those studies with the better methodologies and see if they're right. So let's look at whether or not this, the same results come back with the controls. But the problem is we don't have those studies done as much. So it's much more theoretical where we're saying, well, if they ran the studies this way and it came up this way, then we could validate that there's no pathogenic virus. So we're a few steps further behind in the no virus area. Part of that's due to a lack of funding and hopefully there will be funding to get to the bottom of this. Whereas even in the realm of consciousness, which is also taboo and there's less funding, there is more data that we can point toward. Are you willing to consider the possibility that the reason that there aren't more studies in that area is that it's not sincere in the way that you are sincerely considering it? And that, the, like I pointed out, when you really press somebody like Dr. Sam Bailey and they go, oh, rabies is caused by neurotoxins, that kind of reveals that they're not really serious, sincere scientists. That will not, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, again, I haven't spoken to Dr. Sam Bailey about this, but having watched lots of her videos, she proposed, proposes many theories, and my sense of it is she's trying to provoke creative thought, so, but I, I don't know, um, and, and I've learned from her creative thinking in that area. And let, let's take one area of controls that has been looked at somewhat, the controls in the cell culture studies. So very briefly, this is the idea, the, the 1954 Enders and People study, they take fluids from a sick person. They put it in a soup. It's called a cell culture that has antibiotics, monkey kidney cells, all sorts of things. And they want to see if the cells break down when you take the fluids from a sick person and put it in that soup. And if the cells break down, people say, well, there must've been a virus in the fluids from a sick person. Whereas proper controls would say, well, let's put something else in that cell culture soup and see if things break down, something non-viral. Let's see if the something in the soup itself causes cells to break down without even adding that. Dr. Stefan Lanka, who is a uh, virologist, or really a former virologist, who's now gone on to question the whole thing. He was looking at this with HIV AIDS. The Perth group was involved in looking at this stuff too. But he has a, apparently run some controls where he's added yeast RNA to the cell culture, not a virus, and found cells breaking down. Now, if that can be replicated many times with many other types of different uh, amounts of antibiotics in the cell culture and so forth, that would tell us that the cell culture method, that's the gold standard, is problematic. 
So those sorts of studies should be run, but we don't have that many controls. I've seen some scientists point to accidental controls run in studies that suggest the method's not valid, but that's an area that should be explored more fully. Now, is it since why isn't that being done? I, I don't know because I'm not a virologist. I get you. And we'll we'll wrap it up. I, I would just say that everything you're saying would fit perfectly for me in the incomplete understanding of virus model in that, yeah, something like viruses still exist. The connection between that and it actually creating these illnesses is super misunderstood, is super ill understood, if that's a word. And that, of course, they're kind of protective of not going there because of the implications. Now, but I want to say something because we're, we're wrapping up and I've got to run. But in my book, I talk about things I don't hear enough from the no virus camp, which is our favorite topic of consciousness and how that relates to the physical body. Because if everything is consciousness, then the body is going to be impacted by consciousness. So there's so many psycho-spiritual factors related to illness that we don't hear enough talked about. And one of the topics I talk about in my book, which I have heard some no virus people talk about, is the idea of resonance that there could be a, an energetic contagion that mimics something that we would think comes from a particle. So there's work that's been studied by Dr. Larry Dossi, telesomatic events where you have identical twins. One twin gets injured. You see that same physical injury on the other identical twin that's far away. Many other examples of such resonance, the work of Cleve Baxter on plants that seem to pick up human emotions. This stuff all needs to be replicated more. But the idea that there could be something related to consciousness that looks like contagion, that needs to be explored beyond the realm of just reductionism. Fantastic. Okay, Mark Gober, you're going to, you, you'll all hear a lot more in these dialogues. Thanks, Mark. Good stuff. Thanks, Alex. Thanks again to Mark Gober for joining me today on Skeptico. I got a ton of respect for Mark. I can't imagine anyone else engaging in this kind of dialogue and revealing as much as this dialogue reveals about this process that we're entering into and how multifaceted it is in so many ways. I mean, we got the topic, which is completely banned, completely censored, completely controlled. And then we have this level of AI and there's a deception element there, you know, and they're lying. And then we ultimately have this level of finding some truth in science, in the scientific method and in examining things in a reasonably logical way, which is often really hard to do and is aided by the AI in this case. How it turns out, I don't know. You tell me. But that's going to do it for this one. But there's going to be plenty more of these. I can't see doing anything else in the foreseeable future. This is, to me, the most important thing for me to do, for Skeptica to do. So that's what I'm going to do. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. <laughs>